So he's an awesome guy. And he even gives a talk, so thank you, Brandon. Everything Ron said is a lie. This guy's an idiot. <laughs> He's an idiot. <laughs> All right, so um, I, I think you know most of us work in some sort of technology field. Most of us uh, are, are the types of people that our, our friends and family members come to for advice on anything technology related. And surely in the last probably 18 months, you've heard nonstop blockchain this, blockchain that. Um, I think we've all heard it. And uh, I think there's a time and a place for a blockchain, and that time and place is never. Um, <laughs> so my talk, blockchain is bullshit. Why blockchain technology will not solve any significant technology problems. Uh, this is me. Um, apparently, I should include uh, a bunch of other things, like I swallowed magnets and that sort of stuff. But uh, that'll have to do. Um, so I have a bunch of fine print for this talk. Because whenever you say something is bullshit, you need a lot of fine print. So first of all, I'm not Satoshi Nakamoto. The allegations are not true. I do not wear golden sunglasses. Uh, this talk is not about cryptocurrencies, right? Some cryptocurrencies are kind of neat. Uh, I, not talking about from a, a money perspective, but just from a technological uh, perspective, a lot of cryptocurrencies are, are pretty cool. Uh, Ethereum is, is one of the really, really interesting ones. Um, Blockchains actually solve some problems that cryptocurrencies have. So, so if there's one area where a blockchain is not bullshit, it would be in cryptocurrencies. Never mind that all cryptocurrencies, or at least most of them, are scams. We'll just ignore that. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Honestly, I, I, have a bun I had a bunch of ideas for why blockchains are bullshit without any concrete information or evidence. And so I did a bunch of research, and I found out that none of my ideas are unique. They've all been written, out, written about before. And uh, so... Uh, you're not going to learn anything. If you keep up on this stuff, this talk will not teach you anything because it's all been written about before. Um, this presentation does not reflect the views of my employer. I don't need to say any more there. This presentation will not help you buy Bitcoins, Buttcoins, Scam Coins, or Ponzi Coins, or any other coin. This presentation is way too late. Right? I should have been talking to you at the peak of the hype, but no, I'm talking to you down where there's no more hype. So I've already talking about something that everyone's moved on with. The US NIST, in the process of me doing research for this presentation, completely obsoleted my entire presentation by releasing this flowchart that basically asks you a bunch of questions and then tells you that you do not need a blockchain for every single question. Right? And so after you pass every one of those, which no one could ever pass, you finally need a blockchain down at the bottom. The, if, I know you can't read this, but it's, the answer is database, 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 like the, every single time. Uh, I have a bonus just for the long con. I'm going to be giving away 3,000 ETH. Just send 0.1 ETH to my address, and I'll send you back 10. This, the, this presentation might be a scam. <laughs> This talk is for entertainment purposes only. No warranty is expressed or implied. All righty. So uh, blockchain hype. Um, I, I could just talk for 45 minutes with screenshots on all the insanity surrounding blockchain. Um, but I chose to select just a small number of examples to illustrate what I think the problem is. So Atari is a video game company. Um, I think we've all experienced or at least played some Atari games or at least know the impact that Atari's had. And we all, I think, know that Atari's been in financial trouble for a very long time. And Atari thought, actually kind of correctly, if you look at the graph of their stock, um, that if they released uh, not just one, but two different blockchain like coin token things, uh, that it would do well for them. So they, they launched Atari token and Pong token at the same time. And the, the day that they announced this, their stock shot up by something like 50%. Amazing. Uh, Kodak, another failing company, decided that they were going to release Kodak Coin. Um, and if you look at the, you know, all the sort of the, the great things that they say about Kodak Coin, it is the absolute buzzword bingo. Um, so, uh, and if anyone is is playing along at home or playing, uh, you know, in the audience and, and with an actual bingo card, uh, also I have for you a cloud-based cyber ABT machine learning behavioral anomaly detection. Um, <laughs> So I think we actually just covered every buzzword that there is. 
And that sentence that I just uttered was an actually complete sentence. What has happened to our industry? So if you Google IBM blockchain, I, Google actually helpfully recommends a bunch of other things that people searched for. Uh, Walmart blockchain, Maersk blockchain, Oracle blockchain, Deloitte blockchain, SAP blockchain, Microsoft blockchain, Accenture blockchain, Lego blockchain. That one's the only joke, by the way. Lego blockchain. <laughs> Amazon blockchain, Facebook blockchain, Samsung blockchain, Toyota blockchain. I mean, and, and like I could, I, I only had one slide to waste on this kind of crap. Like it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, so every one, tiny startup, uh, you know, mi municipality, small government, random entrepreneur, big gigantic, you know, conglomerate company, everyone is, has at some point jumped on the blockchain bandwagon or is planning on doing it. Um, so everyone gets a blockchain. <laughs> so what the hell is a blockchain? Um, and this is where the talk is going to get a little bit technical. And I think most people that, that know anything about blockchains know a little bit about hashing and SHA-256 and proof of works and that sort of thing. And I skip all of that. So I, I'm, I, want, I want you to take away from this talk is some sort of semblance and an idea of, of what a blockchain is without really getting you bogged down in a lot of the technical details. So this is gonna be a very high level description. So first of all, it looks like you're trying to fulfill your anarcho-capitalistic libertarian fantasy by creating your own money. Would you like an algorithm? <laughs> so a cryptocurrency is basically two things. A cryptocurrency is a protocol and it's some data structure that interacts with that pro protocol in order to produce something that is a money-like thing. Um, I'm completely ignoring the protocol aspect of these things because, again, this talk is not about cryptocurrencies. This talk is about blockchains. And blockchains were effectively invented to solve cryptocurrency problems, and now people think that they apply to a bunch of other issues. Um, so I'm going to talk about blockchains here. And I'm going to take the approach that, uh, you know, so, so suppose, suppose you want to make your own money, what would you need to do? Um, and we'll talk about some of the components that are needed and why the design decisions have been made the way they, they've been made. So you're trying to make your own money. You want no centralized authority. You want it to be fully distributed, you know, peer to peer. Uh, you don't want any bank or government or other centralized authority, right? It, which is not, does not match traditional money. Um, so you don't want any trusted users. You want some semblance of anonymity, and uh, anonymity is very hard to define, especially in, in most cryptocurrencies where they claim that it's anonymous and it's really not anonymous in any way at all. Um, you want immutable or irreversible transactions. So you don't want, um, if I take virtual money out of my virtual wallet and hand it to you, you don't want me to ever be able to take it back, right? That, that's supposed to be an immutable transaction. Um, and you want it all to be secure. And when people say secure, they really mean secured by math, and that basically means cryptography. So um, blockchain is an algorithm for tackling these details. And it, when you read anything about blockchains, you will probably feel stupid. And that's not because you're stupid, unlike this gentleman. Um, it's because blockchains are complicated and there's a lot of, they're couched in a lot of uh, complicated jargon and complicated terminology that is mostly irrelevant. So you want to keep track of money. Build a ledger. Uh, any accountant or anyone who is familiar with accounting or familiar with finance in general has some idea of what a ledger is. Um, if, you're, if you're not familiar, it's kind of like Venmo, only lamer. Um, this is also known as spreadsheet technology, right? So, spreadsheets. <laughs> um, so you, wanna, you want all transactions to be secured by math. Well, sign all the transactions, and this is known as RSA technology. Um, so it's simple, right? Eve and has a, a public key and a private key, and, and so does a bunch of other people. Um, so Eve signs a transaction, um, so that you can't just say you can't just write on the ledger, Eve. Uh, you know, Eve pays Corey $100. That's not a valid statement. You know, Eve pays Corey $100 signed by Eve's public or private key. That's a valid statement. Um, this is simple. Everyone understands digital signatures, even if they don't understand the math behind them. Um, and it just turns out that if you sign everything, you solve most problems that uh, that blockchains are trying to solve. And uh, Matthew likes this transaction because I guess this is 2018. We have to be able to like these things. Um, 
So you don't want replayable transactions. You don't want, be able, you don't want Corey to be able to copy Eve pays Corey $100 multiple times so that Eve is now paying Corey $1,000. That, that would be bad. Um, and so we add a nonce. This is also known as nonce technology. And uh, a nonce is just a number, and it, it, it's really any number. And so a nonce stands for number used once. Um, and so we just number these transactions. And so transaction one, Eve pays Corey $100. You can't copy that because that number has already been used. And so you would need transaction two, Eve pays Corey $100. But Eve did not sign that. She only signed transaction one, Eve pays Corey $100. So that's no good. You, you can't copy that. So that makes everything not replayable anymore. Um, so um, what happens if you don't want to trust anyone at all with the ledger, right? Because normally with a ledger, there's someone who's actually making the entries in the ledger. What if you live in a world where no one trusts anyone? Here's a video of, or an image of such world. Because um, trust sucks. So let's not trust anyone. So at the, up to this point in the talk, I have not talked about blocks or chains. So, so where is the block chain aspect of this talk? Um, so if everyone has, if, so, so if you force everyone to keep a copy of their own ledger. So I, over here, right, you know, the answer to this problem is to just have everyone keep their own ledger. Right? But that doesn't actually solve any problems because then who has the official ledger? How do the ledger stay in sync? And how can we waste as much energy and computing power as possible? <laughs> right? So ask yourself those three questions and then we have an answer. So uh, we add a proof of commitment. And this is also known as global warming technology. <laughs> um, so the person with the, the, it's a simple rule. The person with the longest ledger has the official one. And so whoever has the longest ledger is just the official ledger keeper. And any time someone makes their ledger longer, now they're the official ledger keeper. And everyone's sort of sharing whatever their ledger is with everyone. And everyone just uses whatever the longest one is. And I'll, this will make a little bit more sense. This, it, it, this will be justified in a little bit. right? The problem is, is that making a ledger longer is super hard and is not easily controllable by the person who's maintaining the ledger, right? There's some amount of luck involved. Now, um, everyone probably with blockchains has heard of like a proof of, uh, proof of work. Some people have probably heard of like proof of stake. Ultimately, it comes down to some, you you're, have some sort of commitment. You're either so committed to this that you're willing to waste tons of electricity, or you're so committed that you have a bunch of money or stake already in the ledger or whatever it is, not, not just money that you're keeping, keeping track of. Okay, so, so a, a ledger, like I said, is a spreadsheet, right? So you're, you're adding uh, you know, rows or transactions to the spreadsheet, and these don't actually have to be financial transactions. You can add anything you want. Any arbitrary data to a ledger will work just fine. This ledger just happens to be Alice pays Bob $100, or Alice pays Charlie $10, that sort of thing. Um, so you segment your ledger into blocks. And uh, so we have block one, block two, block three, and then the fourth block is provisional, right? There, there's additional transactions that have happened beyond what the official ledger, any, any individual user or any individual person is keeping a ledger. There are certain transactions that have happened beyond that. And so there's, that's a part of a provisional block. Um, so Let's actually zoom in and understand what is going on with these blocks. So you've seen blocks. Where's the chains? So here's the chains. Um, so uh, what I've done is I've zoomed into the block one and block two. So, so block one has a, a hash of the block. And then block two records whatever the previous block's hash was. And so those numbers are the same. And then uh, block two has a hash of itself. And now what the important part here is is that the hash of block two contains the hash of the previous block. So the other important part, and this is sort of really subtle, is that you see that these hashes, they start with a bunch of zeros. Um, so there's this property of a hash function that you, you, you give it input and you're completely surprised by the output. You have no idea what the output is going to be until you compute the hash. So you can't go backwards. And so if you want to hash with a particular property, like it starts with a bunch of zeros, you really have no choice other than to just try inputs at random until you get the sort of a, a desired output. And so generating these hashes is really, really hard. 
And if you only accept blocks that have these, these really hard to generate hashes, then you have this proof of work. You, you can, if you can present this to someone and say, well, look, I have this hash with this special property, they can go, oh, well, you must have done a lot of work in order to find that. It's sort of akin to uh, if you give someone uh, a haystack and you have one needle in it, and then they come back to you later holding that needle, then you know that they did a lot of work. Right? You don't have to verify that they went and searched the haystack, or you don't have to know anything about how they did the, the, the needle searching work. The simply presenting you the needle that you hid in a haystack is enough to know that they did a lot of work. Now, there's a chance that they could have gotten lucky and just found the needle instantly. Which, and there's also a chance here, but on average, the amount of work that would be needed is really infeasible. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this and why that this produces something that is relatively secure. So computing these block hashes is really, really, really hard. Um, and this is when you hear about mining, when you hear about mining Bitcoin or mining whatever the cryptocurrency is, what people are actually talking about is generating the hashes to these blocks. And computing these hashes is quite challenging. So um, let's, let's look back at what these sort of design decisions or these design choices uh, gave us. Um, so each block has a hash of the entire block. Uh, this makes uh, blocks not changeable without recomputing the hash, right? You can't go and change Eve pays Charlie $100 to Eve pays Charlie $200 for two reasons, right? Eve did not sign that transaction, so that you couldn't change that. But you couldn't also add a transaction that Eve has signed or, or delete a transaction without also recomputing the hash for that block. And since computing the hashes for a block is very challenging, uh, Changing a block at all is a very large amount of work. And then also, each block contains the hash of the previous block, so they get chained together. Uh, so that means that you can't just insert a block in the middle of things, because that'll sort of invalidate all future blocks. All future blocks that said that they referenced some previous block, if you, if you try to insert something there, the chain has been broken. Or if you try to sort of fork off from that point, uh, you're, no longer the longest, uh, you're no longer the longest ledger. So there's really two types of attacks to think about here, and uh, we should talk about why this sort of mechanism secures both of these attacks. So you can't really change history. Um, so suppose you have this chain of blocks, block one, block two, block three, block four, block n along the top, and you want to go back in time and you want to say, remove a particular transaction. So, so the reason you would be motivated to do this with money, for example, is Suppose you bought a car in block two, and you spent $20,000 or whatever, and you transferred uh, you know, 20,000 virtual dollars to, to Toyota in block two. And at a later date, you want to sort of reverse that transaction and remove that you transferred $20,000 from it, and you, you just get these $20,000 back you know, sort of magically. Well, blocks are always being added, the, the chain is always being added onto and the person with the ledger, the longest chain, has the valid one. And so for you to get everyone in the network to accept this new chain that you're trying to forge where you've changed block two, you have to change the hash for block two, fix the hash for block three, fix the hash for block four, fix the hash for block n, however long this is, and then you have to get one more block onto it. And the moment you have n plus one blocks, you can present this chain to the rest of the network and they'll all accept it as the new valid chain because it's now the longest one. And so this is how you could change history. Um, the problem is, is that uh, the amount of com computational power needed to generate the, 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 the hashes for these new blocks is exceedingly high and the chain is constantly growing, right? It, the whole network is constantly using block three, then block four, then block n, then n plus one, n plus two. So you have to outrace them. In order, to, in order to, to get the longest chain, not only do you have to compute a bunch of work up to the present, but you have, as, you're, as it takes time for the, you to do that, you have to sort of outrace everyone else that's already working on the chain. Okay, and you can't really attack the future either. So, so you may want, there's, there's another type of attack and it's very related to the previous one, which is you may want the Toyota dealership 
to think that you transferred them $20,000, and you don't want anyone else to think that. So that when you're talking to other nodes in the network and you want to spend money, they don't see that you already spent $20,000, so they think you have an extra $20,000 that you really do. But you want to convince the Toyota, Toyota dealership that you transferred them $20,000. So you have to sort of feed them this fake blockchain that uh, has your transaction there, and they're the only ones that are seeing it. Um, and in order for that to work is, is that the Toyota dealership is always looking at everyone else's ledgers to see who has the longest one. And so you have to constantly be feeding them a ledger longer than any other ledger that they see. Um, so you know the current block is sort of the, the light blue one, and you want to do sort of a fake private transaction and just convince one party of that. Um, and, but the whole network is continuing to use the public chain, and so you're constantly having to generate new private blocks that it continues to be longer than the public blocks so that you can convince this one party that they've received a transaction that they haven't actually received according to anyone else. This is what people call a 51% attack. So if you've ever heard of like a 51% attack in Bitcoin or, or another cryptocurrency, if you have more than half of the computing power in the total network, then you can outrun everyone else because you have 51% and they only have 49%. So you can keep the gig going for as arbitrarily long um, and convince you know, someone that the chain is one way without convincing anyone else that the chain is that way. This is not computationally feasible as long as you can't gain more than 50% of the com computational power. Or um, in the cases of chain blockchains that don't use a proof of work, but use like a proof of stake, you need to somehow have more than 50% of the stake. Um, or there's some like, sometimes there's like a lottery system and you have to somehow be able to game the lottery so that you win it more than 50% of the time, which is infeasible uh, for effectively every blockchain. So, uh, a blockchain has the, the following properties, right? So it's a database, it's immutable. And what I mean by immutable, if you're not familiar with that word, is that it's not changeable. Um, it's distributed, it's trustless, it's append only, so you can only add on to it. You can't change the past, which is you know very related to being immutable, and it's crypto cryptographically secure. Well, these are nice properties, by the way. This is really, these, it's cool that there is anything that produces these properties. So do we actually need blockchains? Well, for cryptocurrency, it's very clear that we do, right? If, if you look at what the problems you have for money and you, and you want the requirement that it's distributed and that there's no government in control, it's not centralized, that sort of thing, when you just make a list of those requirements, you end up with something that looks very much like, very much like a blockchain. So do you need a blockchain for smart contracts? I haven't even talked about what a smart contract is. The answer is maybe, probably. Like it would make sense you you would implement smart contracts with a blockchain. Do you need a blockchain for other things? Well, I have, we'll see, and you'll see the answer is no. Um, so, for other, so, so when do we need the following properties? Right? A database, immutable, distributed, trustless, a pen only, cryptographically secure. Remember, you need, you need all of these things simultaneously in order to need a blockchain. So let's just look at them one at a time. So when do you need a database? Well, all the time, because how are you going to lose all your customers' data if you're not collecting it? If you want to collect it, you need a database. right? Um, when do you need immutability? Pretty rarely, actually. Um, usually a full history suffices, and you don't usually need like cryptographic guarantee that things can't be changed. So this is examples like the Wikipedia's edit history. You know, Who cares that there's no cryptographic proof that there hasn't been any change not listed in the edit history? It's good enough. Um, this is also true like with audit logs. You can just ship off copies of the audit logs to some other location without having a cryptographic proof of, of something being immutable. Um, so it's actually pretty rare that you truly need immutability. When do you need distributed data? Well, the actual is, is sometimes, right? So there's lots of reasons to distribute data. You can distribute it because of a fault tolerance or redundancy, but you could also distribute it for, for performance reasons. Um, this would be like MapReduce-like architectures where, where you need to copy the data to a bunch of nodes so they can all sort of process on the data locally and sort of send the results up in a, in a MapReduce architecture. Um, so distrib distribution of data is, is not unreasonable. But fault tolerance is sort of, I think, the main reason. So when you need something that's decentralized and totally trustless? And the answer is basically never, virtually never. Now, I'm excluding the case for cryptocurrencies here. Uh, because you definitely need this for cryptocurrencies, but when do you need those? Well, when you're scamming people, but that's a different story. Um, so uh, when are we ever in the situation where we can't designate some sort of central uh, trusted authority 
Um, it's really rare, especially since virtually all of us work for companies. And when you work for a company, it's, it's, there's a certain amount of trust built into the company. The, you guys are running usually something like an Active Directory or some sort of a centralized authentication database. You're running you know, something like Kerberos where you have a trusted third party already. Like, like technology is already built and companies are already built on the whole idea of a centralized authority. Um, it's quite, quite unusual outside of sort of the libertarian anarcho-capitalistic fantasy that you don't need, that you actually need uh, something that's completely decentralized and trustless. And so when do you need append only? And the answer is not very often. Um, usually things are done append only because the underlying technology is faster because of that or because the underlying technology is simpler because of that. So things that were, th things in the past that were append only were like burning a CD. Right? You, you can't go back and unburn parts of it unless you had like an RW, but never mind how that works. Um, or um, sometimes like flash media is much higher performance when it's append only, where you have like sort of a round robin ring. Um, but it, this is usually just done for performance. It's rare that you truly need append only as an underlying property of the system that you're designing. And then when do we need cryptographically secure assurance? And the answer is actually way more than we think. As an industry, we don't do a very good job of this. Uh, things are oftentimes a lot better and, uh, and certain classes of attacks completely go away when we have cryptographic assurance built in, when we have digital signatures of everything, when we have sort of checksums and, and, and hash like checkpoints, which in, in a blockchain is a block, right? We have a checkpoint of every block. You, you, there's, this offers a lot more auditability. It offers uh, a lot more detection of fault, or detection of tampering, that sort of thing. So we actually, I think, need this a lot more than we realize. So if not blockchains, then if, what if we could just relax some of these requirements? Because remember, to, have a, to need a blockchain, you need all of these. You, you need to simultaneously have all of these properties, and it's very unusual to have a system like that. So if we could just relax even one of those requirements, then why is Git not in a, 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 a solution here, right? Git is effectively impend only effectively immutable, uh, effectively has you know, an audit log, you know, it's got cryptographic assurance, it's a database where you can store arbitrary data in it. You know, Git is already a tool that does almost everything that we need when we relax those requirements even a tiny bit. Now, yes, Git does have some ability to edit history, and, but no one really knows how to do that anyways because, <laughs> so it's effectively immutable. <laughs> um, so if not Git, and Git's not, Git's not actually the right answer. Um, Git is the, is, a, is the right answer for a small number of solutions, but there are better answers for, for most other situations that people uh, try to apply blockchains to. So what about just a database? If you can designate a trusted central authority, then a database suffices just fine. Uh, do you need some level of privacy, that sort of thing? What about an encrypted database? What, what about where you, you, the clients who are sending data to you first encrypt it and then send it to you and you store effectively a binary blob? I mean, that's how LastPass works and who, everyone either uses LastPass, KeyPass or some other password manager, most people do anyways. Um, and you're not sending your passwords to LastPass, how does that work, right? They encrypted the database, you send them a binary blob, they don't have the key for it, they store it for you. You didn't need a blockchain for that. What about a distributed file system? Sometimes, like the, what you really need when you, when you need distributed data is just a distributed file system. And there's a lot of different distributed file systems with a lot of different interesting properties. What about an append-only log file? What if you need auditability, right? So you produce logs, you ship them off to a, 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 a different location where they can't really be changed. The logs have now been separated from the system that the logs are about so that if the system gets compromised, the logs are not compromised. What about digital signatures, right? The, a lot of the problems that, that can be solved, that people advocate a blockchain for solving are actually trivially solvable just with digital signatures. Or how about a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? Blockchains use a peer-to-peer -peer network. Oftentimes the peer-to-peer -peer network is the property of the blockchain that actually solves the problem, not all the other stuff. What about a, a trusted broker, right? So two people that don't trust each other, if they can agree on a trusted intermediary, then they can broker transactions between, between the two people. You don't need a blockchain for it. Um, and sometimes, honestly, a spreadsheet suffices. So uh, in many situations where, where someone says, we need a blockchain, what they really need is a spreadsheet. So blockchains are built for a world that looks like this. 
InfoSec is actually this world. Um, so we're in the castle, and the, yes, the castle's on fire. Um, and yes, we are way outnumbered by the mob outside, but at least it's not this. We have some chance of defending ourselves and building relatively simple systems. This is typically the situation that we're actually in. You know, and that castle might be called Cisco Systems or IBM or whatever the company that we work for. But uh, we can at least trust each other a little bit. We at least have some semblance of, of a trusted authority. Um, we at least have some semblance of borders and we understand whose data we're trying to keep and whose data we're trying to protect and who, who the people are on the outside attacking us, that sort of thing. Um, so this is the world that we live in and this is the world that we need to be thinking about. And blockchains don't solve this problem. They solve this problem. So uh, for more information, uh, like I said, I, not a single idea that I had for this talk was original. And I didn't know that until I started doing research for the talk. And there's really two good, really good resources. One of them is this book, Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain. This book is hilarious, and it mostly attacks cryptocurrencies, but there's a lot of sort of good core ideas about blockchain. And then there's a video on how blockchains work. And if you want to understand more of the technical detail, more about the proof of work, more about the types of attacks, this video is absolutely fantastic. It's incredibly easy to understand. This, the guy who makes this video is a freaking genius. So these two resources are absolutely great resources if you're interested in this area. And uh, I say questions, but I don't really have a lot of time for that. So maybe one or two. You, sir, in the back. Okay. Okay. So it, it's it, so the question was: Suppose your organization and someone proposes uh, a blockchain to to solve a problem. The example was land titles, um, and so the idea behind land titles here is right. You know, there's someone has some ownership of land and, and trying to figure out, you know, proving that you own that land and, you know, finding off claims that other people own that land. How do you, when, when, the, when someone comes to you with the problem, land titles, and the solution, blockchain, how do you sort of quickly socialize the idea that uh, blockchain is not necessarily the right solution to this? Um, so that's actually a really interesting question. And uh, if we go all the way back to the very beginning of my presentation, um, this graph of, of blockchain, if you look at the first, the t number one country in this Google Trends graph, uh, the number one country is Ghana. Um, and you might wonder, well, why? Why is the number one country Ghana? Um, and the reason is, is that in Ghana, uh, they have a significant problem with uh, land title issues, land title disputes. Uh, they, they have a bunch of subsistence farmers who um, have you know, who feel like they own the land, maybe they do own the land, but they don't really have any documentation or proof that they own the land. And Ghana's proposed solution to this is what we'll do is we'll make a land title registration blockchain, and uh, then everyone will, will be able to prove in court that they own land, and you know, we'll be able to settle these disputes, that sort of thing. Um, and it's, it's obviously completely ridiculous. So, so first thing, I think, to, to countering any sort of problem like this is understanding the problem. So what is the problem in Ghana or any other place with land titles? Or what is the problem with wh whatever people propose the, the blockchain is going to solve? And if you understand that problem and you understand where the hard parts in that problem, you oftentimes realize that the hard parts are not actually what the blockchain is addressing. So in Ghana, the hard parts are they have to physically go out and survey land and figure out GPS coordinates and talk to talk to landowners and talk to the neighbors and talk and ask how long has your family lived here and that sort of thing. That's the hard part, right? Once they've done the hard work, they could issue a certificate with a digital signature and a QR code that would validate that the government has issued you this certificate saying that you own this you know, this section of land, here's the GPS coordinates. And then the next time there's a land dispute, they can take that certificate to court. And if the judge doesn't believe them, they can scan the QR code. And we could, we could do this with QR codes and apps and not a blockchain. Or we could do this with a database of land ownership, right? This, so, so the hard part is, is in the surveying and all of the, all the work on the ground of talking to people and, and really writing it all down, writing it all down once and for all. But once it's written down, 
You, you don't need to store that in a blockchain. What does the blockchain solve a part of this problem? You can store that in a database. You can store that in paper on a, on a certificate. You can store that a, a bunch of different ways. Blockchain is not necessarily a great way to store it. So there's one potential property that a blockchain has that could be useful here, which is that it's an open and public database that anyone can query. Right? So, so someone will not even bother to try to steal some of your land if they can already go and check the database and see that you have the certificate that proves that you own it. Because then they'll know that their, their, their claim, their fraudulent claim, is going to be thrown out right away. So an open database that anyone can query, or a database that multiple people have copies of, or that anyone can get a copy of when they write the state, or that anyone has given a copy of when their land gets surveyed, solves this problem. The blockchain is an unnecessary tool for solving this problem. And that's usually the case, that when you really understand what the underlying problems are, you understand where you need to focus your resources, and you realize that the blockchain solution, quote unquote solution, does not actually help you with those. And so I'm out of time, but there's one, well, okay, so I'm not actually quite out of time. Mac is, Mac is telling me I can keep talking. Um, this example, of the poor folks in Ghana having to Google what the hell a blockchain is because their land has to be registered to one is both a, a blessing and a curse. Um, so blockchains, what are they good for, is not a slide that I have. But if I were to have it, getting people to think about these hard problems is a good, good sort of positive benefit of blockchains. People think that a blockchain is gonna solve this hard problem and they get really energized and motivated to go solve that problem. And then they start working on the hard problem of going and surveying the land and talking to the neighbors and that sort of thing. And never mind that they're doing it for sort of weird blockchain reasons, they're actually solving a real problem even if the way that they're ultimately registering it is kind of dumb. So I think I have time for one more question. I don't have another question. So folks, thank you very much for your time.